I'm here with Vu and Yumi, the winners of the uh, Community Caster Challenge from ECS8. Um, basically, guys, just want to start off by knowing where your names came from. Pretty simple right. question. Right, are, we, are you going first or am I going first on go, this one? Go for it, go for it. Right, my name's, my name's just real stupid. Um, I, I didn't really know what to, to go with for a long time. Uh, I went by apple juice with a, a one and a three for, for an age. Um, and I thought, you know, like, oh yeah, I'm not introducing myself as a caster named Apple Juice. Um, and so I decided on something like obscure and weird because my name at the time was it, You Made Me Milk. It's like a joke. I had like a picture of a cow. It was supposed to be funny. Um, but as like a placeholder name, I went with you, uh, M3 as like, you know, the M times three made me milk. It's like a shortened hyphenated version. It was dumb, and I think it's dumb now because branding wise, nobody really knows what to call me. It's like, ah, I've had Yumi 3, UM3, Yumi is the one that I usually go with because it's easy. Um, but I, I wanted it to be sort of a an homage to like Asian culture because Yumi is a word for like arrow, love, and some other stuff in different languages. So I thought that was kind of cute. Um, but yeah, I definitely, I definitely get rid of the three if I, if I could go back and just rebrand myself, but it's, it's kind of stuck for now. And yourself, Yeah. Uh, I, I gotta start coming up with a fake story. At some point at this <laughs> Something point. a little bit more <laughs> interesting, right? I was like eight years old and I, all I'd used was my brother's old names. Like he used to go by floor hacks and I was like, oh, my big brother used to go by floor hacks. So I stole floor hacks when he, when he was fucking changed it. So I was going by floor hacks and then I was one day I was like, you know what? Vu sounds like a cool name. There you go. That's that's my alias. And nice. uh I I really wish I really wish I hadn't gone by Vu cuz uh there was a Quake player named Vu. <laughs> I've heard a lot about that guy. I never, <laughs> never heard of it. Yeah, I heard, I heard you're a big fan. Yeah, huge fan. Hugest of fans. I would definitely have not gone by Vu if I could go back. <laughs> but eight year old me was not super clever. Is that is that when you decided on your on the name Vu when you were eight then? I don't you know. stuck ever I was since? like eight or nine or eleven. Who who knows how old I was. <laughs> it was literally just I was sitting down, I was like trying to think of an alias because I knew I couldn't just keep stealing my brother's old names. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was like, Yeah, Vu sounds like a cool name. That's it. It just popped up in my head. Okay, so was was your brother like kind of introduction to like gaming and competitive games yeah. or is that yeah yeah so he was uh we had one computer and he would play he would play uh counter-strike all day and he would go shower he would go to the shower and i'd get my 15 minutes playing and then he'd come back up and he'd like get off the computer Damn, <laughs> and so but from that where did you get into like uh, CSGO, was it CSGO then or was it CSGO 1.6? No, it was 1.6 and then Source. This is like, was it like 8 or 10? I don't know how old I was. <laughs> I was, I was, I was a, a wee lad and uh, yeah, it was like probably like in the very early 2000s. I think he played 1.6. Then as soon as a computer was good enough to actually play Source, we played Source and then go came out and it was just the worst game ever made for the first two <laughs> years so i took a nice little break there yeah. decided i would never play cs again and uh here we are here we are now you're a caster yeah. and a youtube yeah never playing cs though very <laughs> important i never broke that rule <laughs> so yumi uh, how did what was your first introduction to esports how did you first get into it uh, esports is, is a bit of a different story. I think Counter Strike it started as well. Like brother played it. He had a he had a, a friend that was really really good, and he was he would always like try and get better to like you know beat the friend at some point so he could just you know boast that he beat him. Um, but I didn't really get into esports until like 2014 DreamHack Winter. I, I I was like scrolling through Twitch. I saw that there was a a tournament on. Um, and I went to look and it was the Olaf boost like straight away that that was the first game I ever witnessed and I knew instantly that the drama was just gonna spike from there I went straight to reddit. I saw people just slamming Fnatic for using this thing. That was just insane um, And I it kind of just hooked me in from from there on out I, I'm very much a, a CSGO baby in that like I joined so late and there wasn't 
Uh, oh yeah, I played 1.6 so I played Source. I, I yeah. did play those games, but mainly for like Surf and KZ. I never really cared much about the shooting elements. But that that one instance, I was just like, I I can't not play this game for at least a decent amount of time to see what it's about. Olaf did nothing wrong. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. <laughs> Olaf did nothing wrong. Fanatic, it was. They didn't do anything wrong. Right? <laughs> they were completely in the right. So I, I'm actually going to change up the next question a little bit because it's supposed to be what's your, who is your favorite team right now? But you guys seem to uh, have some interesting opinions. So who do you think is the best team right now? Because obviously this is after the EPL uh, finals where Mouse Sports kind of took the trophy. Mm. Uh, obviously at ECS 8, Astralis took the trophy. So it's is i think it's a really competitive scene right now but i want to get you guys i don't thoughts. think there's any i don't think there's any debate that no. it's astralis there's really just yeah. it's, it's it's astralis like there's question maybe the thing is eg's totally falling off eg seems like they're nothing compared to what they were for a few tournaments in a row there liquid they're never gonna beat astralis like a lot of teams can play astralis close but you get to like 14, 12, 12, 12, whatever. Liquid is never going to have the mental fortitude to beat Astralis. It's not going to happen. I think, like, you went into the major, and they had that They had that chance. They had the fleeting moment where they had a really good series. Yeah. Even deep in the games, they were playing really well, which you never see. They were, like, going blow for blow. They could still fight aim-wise against Astralis late on in the games, which you usually see them totally crumble in those moments. I mean, the only reason they didn't get too old last time is because of that uh, smoke play from Naf on Vertigo. Like, they really should have just lost Vertigo and then lost the series. Uh, but as soon as they lost that, it was like PTSD kicked in. Like, they're just... <laughs> every for semblance of hope, they were like, all right, we're, they went into the major thinking like, all right, we can beat them. We, we won so many tournaments. We're a good team. And then as soon as they lost, they're like, they beat us so many times. Like, we only beat them once. Like, fire they're back on form. We're, there's no way we can win. And now you can just see it. As soon as it gets close, it's over. You, they're yeah. never winning. And I think Liquid, when they got caught off, they, like, they didn't realize that they were the team to beat at the time like i think it took them a while to set in that they were the top team they were number one and that astralis would like throw something weird at them because astralis have set this standard for so long like oh we play by the book we do the job well all of our players are capable and then they they threw in like oh we've hard anti strategy your best map in your pool and liquid just like weren't they just weren't ready and i think that that goes into that, that ptsd moment where just like they know that they're going to be preparing for them as opposed to just playing the, the way that Astralis plays, um, which kind of shakes things up a bit. I think it's a, it's a really hard question to answer because I think for the year, I would probably put on Liquid. Um, but right now, I would say Astralis because they've just they've just been so much better for so much longer that when they, they win a tournament like that in the in the manner that they did, it's it's hard to not put them at that number one spot. Yeah, I think Liquid probably took the year. It just depends how much you put on majors. And yeah. at this point, I mean, it's tough to put that much on majors. There's so many ridiculous tournaments. And just the way Liquid was winning when they were winning was yeah. just insane. Yeah, so obviously, uh, you, so you kind of both put it on Astralis being one of the greatest. And obviously, Team Liquid for Yumi. Uh, I personally think Astralis are probably one of the best. And you just look at their performance at ECS. Uh, yeah basically just I actually um, I actually feel kind of like liquid might be I'm gonna get crucified for this <laughs> one if I haven't been watching enough liquid might actually just be better against not Astralis than Astralis is against not liquid you okay. know what I mean like yeah liquid just cannot beat Astralis and they always have to meet at some point because they're the two best teams but I feel I don't know actually I, I just want I just want I'm just trying to save liquid in my own mind because when I really think about it, I don't know if I really believe that. But, <laughs> like, I like Liquid. I want them to be better than just number two. I want something more to be there. And I'm just trying to, like, this is my brain trying to save Liquid. The great kind of North American hope. <laughs> uh, so, to kind of get back into you, your guys' casting careers, what is the driving force behind your kind of casting? What makes you want to cast? 
Um, Jump in whenever you want. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it, it kind of came at like a, I feel like a good and a bad time for me. Um, like university-wise, I've never really been the most interested in in the academic side. Like I'm always interested in the theory. The, the paperwork is kind of just a pain. Um, and so I never really like fully invested into it. And so I I've gone for like my I think it was like my third year at uni, and I was just saying like I'm not. I don't see this going anywhere that's relevant to, to my own passions and like i've been following esports since probably 2009 um i i started with dota 2 and that was kind of the, the driving hey, force at that dude. at that point um and then uh when i got into cs after after watching the olaf boost um there was like a tournament straight afterwards something like um like an esl1 and and some of the some of the games weren't being streamed like there weren't b streams back then um, so I took it on my own self, you know, good old silver for me, casting games on Nuke. Like, I'd have no idea what's going on. I'd never heard the call-outs. I had no idea what to call anything. Um, the worst cast I've ever done to the history of ever. Um, but that small moment where, like, I realized that there was a space or a gap, um, I started to put a little bit more time into, like, developing that side of things. I started playing com uh, kind of competitively. I never really broke through, but... Um, I took a, a coaching role at one point and just having to analyze a team and then break that down in the most bite-sized or, or the most digestible manner uh, kind of honed the skills or I felt like it, from a, like an analyst point of view and just that is basically what you have to do to the viewer. You have to try and compartmentalize and focus on the important bits so that they understand why this person doing this one thing has such a huge impact or has some sort of bearing on the round. Um, and, and kind of from there, uh, because my university studies weren't going so well, Omen did, ran a, a caster competition, took part, I won that. Um, and then around that same time, Dinko and Hawker got to cast at ECS season five, or I think. Um, I probably got the season wrong, but <laughs> after that, all these ECS caster challenges have just been so, uh, interesting in that you don't know whether you're going to get that same chance hmm. so it's kind of that breaking down of the of the play in, in real time as well and using yeah. the analytical side of it okay and Vu what about you uh so I had a an interesting journey into casting <laughs> I started in uh I started casting in 2015 when um I think I think my mentality because I'm just I'm speculating at this point. I really don't remember. I think because I remember being really angry about all the pro players they were jamming into broadcasts over and over. They brought in nothing. Who, great guy. He's not made for casting. Like analyst desk, maybe. I don't know. I haven't seen him casting. Absolutely not. He's not a caster. It just doesn't work. It. The thing is, maybe he could do it if he was given training if you would practice it was like they picked him up off the street and said here jordan take a mic they're gonna like you cast for us and then they brought in who else did they bring in they brought in like someone uh, they were bringing in players from teams that that got knocked out and they brought in some players like apex or something that didn't even speak english and okay. i was like this is awful this is really <laughs> awful i'm pretty sure that's when i started casting i'm pretty sure that's when i got into it and then um the problem i had is like i had a couple events that didn't pay me i got flown out to the other side of the country for an event that didn't happen uh <laughs> the ev the events that did pay me i was doing this college league and they were good guys but they were clearly mega understaffed so games would get rescheduled and i wouldn't get told so i'd have like a full night dedicated to this and they'd be like oh there was four games oh there's only there's only one now and i was like after the land that didn't happen i i was i was done so i casted for like <laughs> four or five months in 2015 and then i came back because uh i casted this mmo i'd like you can't cast an mmo not not this one at least yeah. and uh but I would just do like meme casting. Like I would just make jokes and stuff. And people were like, oh my God, this is really good. So uh, there was this land in Vancouver and there's no reason they should have hired me. I mean, I hadn't done anything for like five years at that point or four years. And I was just like, hey, 
uh, here's here's the cast of me. Oh yeah, uh, part of it is because um, Mythic Cup. They randomly asked me to cast a game. I think. I think they just asked me to cast the game. So I had this game and I sent it to the LAN in Vancouver and it was just a horrible cast. It was so bad. But I guess these guys like didn't really know what they were doing. They didn't really have any, they were desperate apparently. So I casted that and then just came back in. I, it, kinda, I mean, it just the problem in 2015, back in. yeah, the problem in 2015 was there wasn't much to cast, yeah. right? Like I had bad experiences with what I did cast, but Sivo wasn't responding to me. That was like the main one other than ESEA. And ESEA, there was a thread where people were like, look at Vu, he's casting all these open main games. We really love them, hire them. And LP Kane showed up in the thread and was like, not a fan, sorry. And then, <laughs> and then with Face It actually, someone, I, I can't remember how I got in contact with someone, but I asked someone, I'm like, hey, can you take a look at one of my casts? And they're like, oh, this is really good. Let me like, like, maybe we should hire you like let me get in contact with the <laughs> casting team obviously that went nowhere right so i was getting like mistreated by these leagues and these orgs and also all, the only three major casting opportunities were like no goes so uh luckily now there's casting competitions that's like a very nice thing it's it's very nice it's actually a chance to do something and there's also open go tv ip so you can actually cast consistently now instead of back then it was like it was a disaster man it was a disaster yeah i mean there's always something to cast nowadays right there's so many tournaments all at the same time yeah. for whatever reason like i think coming up next weekend there's like five tournaments it's crazy and oh yeah I and I've had, uh, I've, I've gotten the chance. Of some, like a, a couple of them have been like, oh yeah, you can maybe cast the, these games. It's like, ah, I can't. Like I, I booked that weekend off like a year and a half ago. So it'll be, it'll be kind of dodgy. Just be like, ah, somebody contacted me three days ago. Sorry, can't make that thing that I said I'd, I'd hundred percent do a year ago. So it, it's, it's there's so much CS that they're all compacting at the same time, and I don't know how they have enough teams to actually fill all the slots sometimes. <laughs> So, Vu, you seem to have quite a storied past in casting. What is like one of the one thing that you wish you knew when you started? That's that's a troublesome question. Yeah. It's a troublesome <laughs> question because I mean, re really, if I'm being completely honest, like I wish I knew that casting was gonna like blow up in 2016. I think it was where it was like the competitions came out a lot more leagues started coming through and like it actually started to be a thing that you could get into without just like having the, i don't know the the stroke of luck like the the grace of god to luckily make your way in like i i don't know how anyone did it back then but with with the casting competitions with a lot more leagues and stuff it blew up shortly after i departed the casting scene so really really like it would be nice to pretend that i wish something else happened like i wish there was something else i wish i was a better caster no i wish i knew that i was making a huge mistake getting out of casting when i did but it's hard to have motivation when you're you're, you're cast i mean i was also i burned myself out i was casting like four hours like six hours a day six days a week for like four months for nothing for just esea open main advanced wasn't good wasn't just good everything. Oh, wasn't good. so may yeah. maybe not go as hard maybe yeah yeah maybe that's maybe that's that's the uh that's the the nice answer just <laughs> don't burn don't try up. so hard but, but that's like that's me in a nutshell i played like i was playing this mmo in 2016 2017 like 16 hours a day like all day every day for like a year and a half like burning myself out is my mo like go play a game <laughs> literally never stop thinking about it dream about it play it until i'm like pretty good and then oh, i'm bored now we're, we're done here and, and you mean what same question um probably to just not have a life i guess <laughs> don't I, ever I, have I, fun well I, I i just didn't realize coming into it just how so it's a lot more professional now, but it's even still like you get contacted sometimes like 30 minutes before a game is going to go live. Like, hey, do you want to cast this thing? It's like, yes, I do, but I have this other thing to do instead. So it it's one of those things where 
at the drop of a hat, these some of these TOs are just like, I need somebody, here you go, here's your chance. And whether or not you're able to fulfill it, like, they, at the end of the day, people don't care about what your reasons are. It's just like, ah, they said no, That's move on to the next guy. That's 100% real. That's 100% real. Like, it, it's you get, just you get the so one opportunity, many. right? You get a yeah. random random message. There's so many good casters. Like, there's so many casters that you're not going to have a problem with if they get you on broadcast. So they just message someone they know. And if you're, if you're that guy, they're not going to hate you. They're going to bring you back. But if they message the next guy and he's good, which there's a good chance he is, then you've lost a huge opportunity potentially, right? Yeah, because you, you move down the list, that guy moves up, right? And yeah, then suddenly yeah. it's just, yeah. Uh, so probably that it'd just be like be available all the time <laughs> because you you will get the chances. Okay, cool. So I want to take it into the kind of the regular season of ECS8 and obviously the community caster challenge. Basically, can you give us just a, a brief overview of how that works, really? Because from the outside, it may not be so obvious. Maybe you guys are assigned certain games and you know those kinds of things. So so the way that they did it was that uh, obviously face it were broadcasting the games that they thought were going to be the closest or the best to watch um, so they'd pick a couple of games maybe either on the day or a couple of days before um, and then they just kind of say these are the games you can cast you have to do it on your own personal caffeine channel and then whether or, or not that gets promoted by the the ECS Twitter or anything um, that that sort of happened a couple of weeks but sometimes didn't happen other weeks uh, I think they tried to implement it more and more, but the idea was that um, I think they were partnered with Caffeine, so the Caster Challenge was exclusively ran through there, and it was it it was a good uh, it was a good sort of uh, platform to do so because if you're if you're being promote, promoted by the official channels, then it's sort of these are our community casters, go show them uh, some love, you know, uh, that kind of thing. Um, there are some grievances with with the platform. Uh, I will. I mean, if you want, you can expand on that. But it it, it was just basically uh, shoot your shot, cast as many games as you could, and you know maybe it, you impress the right people, and I guess you you get to go all the way through to to the to the final stage. I'll give them one thing. The one thing this definitely did is it was like a test of your dedication. Okay. <laughs> Because if you were gonna, if you were gonna win it, you had to cast to nobody, to the, to just, you had to cast to the open air, because you never knew if they were gonna watch, right? You know, you really didn't know if they were gonna watch, because they wanted to make it fair. So instead of having people record a vod and upload it, they wanted to make it fair because some people couldn't do that. So they just said, "We will watch your stream." So it really was like you had to have the dedication to potentially be casting to nobody and not win and continue to do so so i will give them that it was like and also i almost felt like the the broadcast package they had you set up at the start was almost like a test of dedication like they didn't really clearly explain it it they had an explanation but it was like outdated and mm -hmm. i was like this took me like an hour to set up maybe that maybe this is supposed to be like a barrier to entry because it feels like isn't everyone kind of accepted and you can just do it right yeah it's it, they they have it fairly open right so anyone can maybe just it's a conspiracy it. theory like this is their barrier to entry <laughs> is that you have to know how to set this up right so then in terms of the record season what was your guys favorite moment that you casted oh god um i can't remember who this was against or who or even who, which the teams were, but I think I, I, I casted a moment where they are playing Inferno, um, somebody's pop flashing into to B apps, and this guy is just walking through apartments, and the flash pops, he doesn't get blinded, he kills the guy that goes to peek him. The reason why, there's a chicken that blocks the flash. Oh, yeah. And, and instantly from there, I was just like, I can't believe I've just... This, <laughs> this small little thing that just runs around the map aimlessly has actually saved this guy dying for all the right reasons like the team play was perfect the timing was perfect he was never going to turn around but a chicken uh <laughs> it changed the round they still lost the game so i guess it doesn't really matter but it's one of those things was like it's a small tidbit that's, that's out, out of anything that's like the most memorable just because it's so it's like a one in one hundred thousand probably 
Yeah. I mean, it's like that time when, uh, I can't remember who, who it was, but someone, it was also an Inferno, and they were saving, and, and the chicken was blocking the door. Oh, yeah, that yeah. Was they, that was so funny. But, so Vu, what was your, what was your favourite? Honestly, can't really remember any of the games <laughs> I casted. Yeah. So, I mean, the one moment I remember is the one Yumi just said, because I saw it on Reddit. <laughs> but, with the ECS thing, I was casting, like, uh, for a full month and a half there, like, seven days a week, every day. So, it all blends together. Yeah. Like, for example, I looked back, and the Quest played Riot Squad for the ECS Pinnacle Cup. Yeah. I casted that. I know I casted that. I also casted them for the DreamHack Atlanta qualifier. I casted them for Mythic Cup 3 or 4. I casted them for ESCA MDL. So which one of those <laughs> is the one I remember? I have no idea. So you must be quite quite familiar with the teams, though, at least, from that. The Quest and Ride yeah. Squad, I've casted <laughs> that about seven times. So definitely know that one. It's all about whether you recall like anything of importance when it comes down to the game, right? Because it's just like there's so many of them. Um, yeah, like... I've got my notepads. I've got my my sea of notepads, right? And I I think that's that's one of the issues I find right now with um with caffeine, and I'm sure we're gonna get into it, but uh whether there not being any any vods or clips functionality stuff like that it makes it really hard to get those highlight moments but like mm. um how you've kind of talked about the struggles of setting up caffeine what, what was what was kind of the issues for you guys how can they improve it for next time all right i feel like this is gonna be like bad angel and then batter angel <laughs> like there's no or like a devil on both shoulders okay. um I'll, i guess i'll start in that like with that, with that moment, I, I, I casted it, I noticed it immediately, it would have been great to put up on my Twitter or whatever, generate some traction, you know, just social media um, stuff. Uh, the player that it happened to, I, 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 I DM'd him on, on Twitter and told him it happened, he went back into the VOD and he just laughed, like, through the GoTV and it, and it blew up. And I was just like, that could have been, that could have been my internet clout. Um, <laughs> but, but caffeine as a whole, I think it's just... It's got, it seems to have resources enough that it's sponsoring these after shows, it's doing all these tournaments, but the bandwidth isn't there, the the interface, it is so difficult to find. It, if, you're, if you don't know who you want to watch and you're just looking for somebody, it is so hard to find someone that is relevant to the thing that you are interested in. So if I wanted to watch Dota 2 or CS or Apex, I can't specify which game i want to watch i can't i have to just scroll through and hope somebody is streaming that um the the video quality the recommended settings are something ridiculous like 540p at 30 fps um and if you try and exceed that it just turns into a jittery mess uh, i think there was one time i even tried using those settings and it was still a jittery mess but at lower resolution um it's, it's a platform that seems to have all of these resources for the marketing side of it, but the infrastructure is just so absent. And I don't really understand why it's so lopsided, given that from a branding point of view and, and their tournament outreach, they seem to have the connections. So it shouldn't, it shouldn't really be that difficult, I don't think. But I mean, the reason, part of the reason people stay on Twitch, other than the fact that people just hate change, is that Twitch, it's easy to find like it's easy to find people or streamers it, it's they've got clip functionality they've got video functionality they've got all this stuff that means once you go there you can stay for a long time but if you go to caffeine you're not staying once the tournament is over and maybe there's something there for like mobile live streaming maybe there's something there the chat disappearing in 10 seconds maybe it makes it less um less like clutter cluttered sorry yeah. it, it makes it less cluttered for uh for someone streaming from their phone or something so maybe there's something there for that but if that's their plan then i don't know why they're doing esports and, and... And, it's not, and it's not like they don't have good content ideas right like the after sh like the, the ecs uh caffeine after show some like i know some people would be interested in just getting a sit down with a player and asking questions and just kind of shooting shooting the shit like having those moments where it's just raw doesn't really matter just talking like that that is valuable in the same way that you run kind of traditional interviews it's just 
higher production value. But it's just who's going to stay through the audio cutting out. Sometimes the, the screen will go black and then you're, you know, someone's teleporting around the room like that's it's it's just not a, an enjoyable experience, even when you are on the platform. So, so from what I'm gathering, right, from the constructive criticism, right, it's, it's infrastructure and kind of discovery is something. Yeah. That... I think they've kind of screwed themselves. <laughs> I'm not a business major here. Okay, but now you have people that, re like, they recognize caffeine as that website that I went on that didn't really work very well. And now it's... They, I don't know who to compare this to because I know companies have done, in the, done this in the past where the product just isn't ready, but they're ready to start pushing it. Yeah. And if they waited maybe six months until the product was ready, because they can't be happy with the product they have. There is a no, there is a no percent chance that they're like, this is the end game. This is what we're putting out and we're putting millions and millions of dollars into. I think they started probably someone up there was like, we have to get the product in the view of the consumers. And someone was like, but boss, it's not ready. <laughs> <laughs> I've given it all she's got. <laughs> that's that's that, I really feel like that is very likely that that's what happened. Uh, it, it reminds me a lot of like ESL being exclusive on Facebook, like oh, that boy. kind of that kind of thing where it, it was the platform clearly wasn't ready for esports, and everybody made their opinion very well known um, that it was a terrible idea. And and ever since, like, sure they've been doing Facebook streams. The infrastructure's gotten better, but they're no longer exclusive because it 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 just tanks the metrics and it tanks the viewership. Well, now even even if you say streaming on Facebook, it's a joke. You're laughed at if you say you're like streaming on Facebook because everyone remembers Facebook being a total joke, and so nobody's going back and like actually on Let's give further it a thought, chance. it might yeah. be good. It, first of all, nobody will admit they were wrong. <laughs> no, 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 that's not a gaming thing. They'll go back and they'll be like, oh, this is better, but it's still terrible. Even if they came in with the first, if this was their first view, they'd say, oh, it's pretty good. I think, I think the same thing might have happened with YouTube. I feel like it must have, because YouTube streaming actually seems really, really yeah. good. Like, it just seems very good. It's hard to discover things, but it seems really good. But I don't know if the community hates YouTube or if it's the same problem. I don't think I was really watching at the time. I mean, I, I really like the YouTube streaming service because you can pause it and then come back at the same point. Oh, it's whereas, amazing. Like, exactly. Stuff yeah. like that is like a godsend. I but... think the clipping is the problem. I think people... The thing is, people underrate how important clips are. Clips are like the way the community interacts with the streamer and the way the community interacts with themselves to feel like happy. Like, yeah, they get, the, at... they get their own thing out of it, right? Yeah, exactly. And like you, the person that clips it or someone was that was there for the clip is like, I was a part of this. I was a, even if you did absolutely nothing, you were just there when the clip happened. And you go, I was a part of this moment in esports history, right? And I think that's a bit underrated. Cool, awesome. So that's kind of the regular season. I think we we, we covered everything that we sidetracked a little yeah, bit. A little, we yeah, a little bit. But so moving on to the finals then. How, how did you guys find the eSports Stadium? Have you been there before? Have you experienced the venue? Obviously, they previously done the eSports Awards. They did uh, ECS 6. What did you do think of the venue? The venue was nice. I, I, I kind of got lost the first day that I was there, I'm pretty sure. Just winding corridors. Especially when you're getting the tour of like, oh, these are the backstage areas. It's like, okay, how do I get back to like yeah. regular areas now? Um, it, it was... I think bigger than I anticipated, but when it came to the, the final staging grounds, because I know for the first few days, because it was online, or not online, but there wasn't a, a live audience for some of it, um, they had segmented off an area that was for those PCs, for those setups and everything, and then um, they kind of corded that off and never opened it up. Um, and so I'd imagine if they... I, I don't know whether it comes down to like ticketing or what, but I imagine if they had... if given the chance they maybe would have opened that up and it would have been just a larger kind of spectacle uh but the stage was was excellent just honestly for for my first time ever going to to a face event it's 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 what i expected it to be glitz glamour big open area um and just 
yeah, overall it seemed it seemed pretty good, but I, I have very little to compare it to. I've come from sort of the epic lands and these smaller uh, these smaller tournaments. So everything from there on out is just like the bar is set. The bar is set here for epic land. Everything else is supposed to be that much higher. I have the exact opposite experience because the last land I went to in North America was MLG Columbus. And that was, you cannot set the bar any higher physically in terms of just the games were amazing. The venue was amazing. There was ridiculous amount of people there. People were asking for my autograph, which made me feel really <laughs> warm and fuzzy inside too. You know, I'm sure that helped a little bit. Right. But I mean, there was nothing wrong with the esports stadium. It was very nice. It just, it wasn't, the stands weren't full. That was the only yeah. problem I had with it. I, I said to someone, I think at some point, like, it's a shame how nice the stage looks with how m many empty chairs there are in here. And maybe it was because I wasn't really out there for the finals. Maybe it was packed for the finals. I was there for like some of the early playoff games, things like that. I just looked around. Usually we were back in the green room playing ping pong. <laughs> but, uh, you know, yeah, it was it, it was a really nice venue. It was just a bit a bit small and uh, just just I mean, if they can't fill the stands with that many people, you can't expect it to be any bigger and yeah. have more empty seats. But Again, maybe it was full for the finals, it's hard to say. I mean, like, in comparison to ECS7, which they did in London, in, in the SSE Arena, uh, which is where they also did the Major, uh, like, I remember that state, that kind of arena being massive and just having thousands and thousands of seats. And it was, it did get packed for the final, which is kind of interesting because it's just Vitality and Fury. It was not really a big <laughs> ticket game. Mm. But, like, it, I feel like it's one of those things, if you build it, they come, right? Uh, maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe is it due to the area or I don't know. And, and, yeah, I think I think pro that problem probably stems from one so so many more events happening in America like over these past few years, um, and there being so few events actually in the UK. Like by comparison, uh, I know loads of my friends that don't usually attend events, say in Cologne or uh, Krakow or whatever. They went to the the face it major. They went to ECS seven because it was in the, in the UK. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. You want to promote and you want to help as well, kind of encourage that kind of behavior. Because the more you attend events like that, the easier it is to market for events in the UK in the future. Cool. It also could have been a, a, a ticketing thing. I'm not mm. trying to be too cynical <laughs> here, but if you have if you have a huge stadium, you have to just give away the tickets. You just, you can't, you're not getting 20,000. I don't, they're not getting 20,000 people. <laughs> you're not getting like 3,000 people, however many people you fill a stadium with to pay a hundred dollars. It's, it's not happening, right? But if you have a smaller venue, you can up the prices and actually maybe, maybe you make even more if you're actually selling all the tickets instead of focusing on getting people into the seats because i imagine you also have to spend more for marketing because it just looks so bad if you have a sea of empty seats you know what i mean i mean i, I quite liked it being a relatively smaller venue though as well i mean mm. did you, you saw the computers and the setups out the front and stuff like that it kind of it almost yeah. gave it a kind of communal feel where it wasn't just about the csgo games it was it was about more of the community in yeah, and opinion. it gave people a thing a thing to do when, say, they the, the team that they wanted to watch wasn't playing. They just go, like, there were rows, I think, of five PCs all set up, so you could just uh, go with all uh, your, I guess, your team or whatever. Yeah, play some stack. Yes. Uh, yeah. I know I know. I was playing uh, some Rocket League at one point or another. I stole Duck Spot for a couple of rounds, <laughs> and I didn't do any better. Um, yeah, I... I, I, I appreciated that sort of entrance to it i think the from from the from the viewer or from a random audience member standpoint the the walk in through to the through to the same past all these pcs past the ecs shop or whatever straight into that open area i think that looks and and feels really good um but i think i echo that same sort of sentiment that like if it were a fully packed venue it, it would go I suppose less from that community vibe and more into like this is the highest level of CS. This is what we just want to watch and experience this live. 
I guess it depends what you're looking for as a tournament organizer, yeah. as a viewer, all that. Like for me, the more people, the better. Like I hate baseball, <laughs> but I went to a Toronto Blue Jays game once, and you can't not love it when there's like what thirty thousand people all screaming. You can't not love it, right? And I enjoyed the hell out of this game. And <laughs> baseball is my least favorite sport. I've never watched baseball for more than five minutes at a time in my entire life but you got the vibes and when i went to mlg there were some real vibes in that <laughs> arena with so many people there there was some good vibes cool so then obviously you guys won the community caster challenge and the prize was to go out there and cast the game uh obviously it was a collegiate game uh mm -hmm. but how what's the biggest difference between casting professional cs and collegiate cs would you say uh, it's just the quality, right? Yeah. It's it's like I'm somewhat familiar with it because I've I've obviously cast like some UK Open games, and I mean even even all the way through through main, sometimes even sort of like some of the prem games as well. They can sometimes be a bit of a, a cluster. Um, it was kind of that same experience, and I, I know JRT did like a load of notes and analytics on like which team should be the favorites, like. Even doing our own little homework, we knew who the favorites should have been. Um, we done all these notes, and then the the wrong team won. And it's just kind of like, oh, I predicted that, it. It's like, I just yeah, want to say, it's, I like, it's like it's like none of that matters anymore. <laughs> I, I, and and because it's a show match, it's it's a weird space in which like these teams obviously care about the end result, like pride wise. They're they're getting they're going to to ECS as well. I think uh, sponsored to do so. Um, so they're they're kind of enjoying the event, whatever. And you know, showing up on a big stage in front of a uh, a crowd is is nice to do, but it's um, it's also at the end of the day a show match. It's filler for the the top tier talent, and so it's it's a weird space to fill because you don't know whether to cast it super seriously, like it's an intense game, when you know it's just not going to deliver on that same expectation. I guess you kind of want to take it seriously for the players. And make yeah. it feel like it's their their kind of moment, but also you you recognize that it's yeah like yeah, some some people just won't be interested. That's a tight rope to walk because the fans, the viewers, hate to say it, guys, they don't give a shit about college CS. They don't care. Like really, maybe their parents are watching, right? Their parents are watching. Their families watching. They do care, and the players care. So. You want to give them the experience that they want to have, which means if they have a good moment in that game, you want it to be a good moment. And they can go back in the VOD and be like, look at this, dude. On a stage in front of thousands of people, hundreds of people. I don't know how many people were in the stands at the time. In front of a ton of people or on the stage in the moment at ECS. I got this 4K look at the casters screaming about it right like that's what you want and you don't want to rob the players of that but at the same time the only reason anyone that's not playing in the game is going to watch that game is because is if the casters make it enjoyable themselves by being funny or having good moments the game itself is not going to be what carries the broadcast unfortunately so it's a very, very tough tightrope to walk. And sometimes you, you might make a comment that you later regret about one of the teams in those games because you're trying to be a little bit too funny. Let's not go too in depth about that one. <laughs> but you can definitely make mistakes on that tightrope because if, if you slip off the tightrope, long way down, man. It's a long way down. And, and even for us, like we, we were on stage or we were like by the analyst desk casting those games. So we were in the, in the arena at the same time. So it was like, even for us, like that's, that's a nice experience being on desk, doing the whole, uh, point, 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 you know, uh, talking to each other with the desk in front of you, that whole thing. Um, so like, that's all a nice experience as well, but it's also at the end of the day, it's, it's that same sentiment where, uh, or a bunch of people that some some will or may or may not know. Maybe there's like one percent of the audience that will recognize each of us individually. Um, but at, in the grand scale of things, they are waiting to see uh, proper Counter Strike and the the casters that they know, love, have in their hearts and souls. Like it, because at the at, at, in some points, like that that earlier point we brought up where. Um, well, like nothing, and I think for Flaren dropped it in and out of cast, and they got Apex in. 
it, it's it's the love for the individuals sometimes that will carry you through. It doesn't have to be your end of like your actual casting talent. It will just be oh I love this player. Let's see what his inside is. Um, and so it's it's a weird like we want to prove ourselves as like oh yeah we we know what we're talking about. We've got the chops, but also it's a show match and it's teams that we don't really know too much about and also don't have the experience or won't deliver that high level play. Um, but again, it's one of those things as well where we were doing it on caffeine and so it wasn't the most accessible and even when it was accessible to some people, it is, it, it was choppy. Or at least from what I've, from, from what I've heard, it was yeah. a, a laggy stream. Like I, I, had, I had friends and family that were like, oh yeah, we'll see you on the big stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, I could barely watch it. Like, ah, yeah. cool. My girlfriend stopped watching because it was too laggy. Mm. Yeah. And she, that was unfortunate. Uh, it was it was nice being in front of the stadium though. Yeah. That was like we casted the other show match as well. <clears throat> um, we got both experiences, right? Off and <laughs> it was it was better in the stadium. It was clearly better. And when I made my my really bad dad jokes, I could <laughs> I could get some feedback. But it is it is troubling. It's it's troubling for for the casters, and I don't want to be like. I'm not trying to pity party here, okay? Because it, I I won, I could have lost, right? But I feel, nobody's gonna believe me that I feel for other casters, where it's like, you go to this event, especially because I won both casting challenges this season. So I'm like, I feel like I can look at it from a third party perspective and be like, well, I don't really care that much. And if, if you've only won the one, or JRT, for example, that won last season and then got to come this season, it's like, you have this idea in mind that you're going to get something really big that you're you're going to get you this is your break you know and the 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 troubling thing is just that you go into this college game and the skill level is it, they're not bad they're like much better than the silvers that will say this is terrible cs in chat right they're much better than that but it's not flashy super great cs and you don't really get a chance to show yourself as as a good caster because you, you just you can't in that situation I, I think as well like even from like a feedback point of view um the people that you would like as casters would look to for feedback like there is there's talent at the event obviously like hired for the event those are the those are the most valuable because they they understand they can sort of nitpick at small details um the for the show match that we did with ddk and bardolf that's two people already eliminated as, as like potential uh constructive criticism people and uh, the other i uh, i know that there were several of the casters that just either didn't watch the game or didn't really care um and so it's kind of it's it's really hard to um get that feedback where okay even if we were trying to be more on the banter side as opposed to being super serious it you can't get that same level of uh feedback from an event like that which is really your best chance to do so like you're in a proper production area proper talent everything is uh uh is formal but either the people that were it's not that people didn't care it's just they were so much more focused on preparing for the final as opposed to caring about the outcome of a show match um yeah, which yeah. which it's like it's it's a really tough sell to be like oh yeah how how, how was our casting and in which case like you know they haven't watched it it'll just be like oh yeah it was good <laughs> like it's <laughs> it, it's it's one of those things where, like there's very few takeaways where it's the the most constructive experience it was it was a fun experience and I, I i like i value that of course um but from a from trying to make this a more serious and like a profession or career path it's it could have been more valuable on that side so what, yeah, what i'm getting yeah. from you guys is it's kind of more of a prize rather than a, like an opportunity yeah 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 it's exactly what it is i mean there's some opportunity in that you can make some connections but the connections you're the thing is the connections you want to make are with the guys that are the tier one talent or tier two talent depending on how you look at it the guys on broadcast that are doing what you do and in reality the connections that you can make are you you're like at the bar after the game and you meet up with some guys from production yeah. that will actually have your ear and you can have a chat whereas the guys that are talent that are the guys you're really looking at is like, I want to impress these guys. To them, you're a glorified fan.
you know, you're they respect that you're casters. They're they're not like looking down on you, but I can see it in their glazed over eyes that like they don't really care and there's nothing you can do to make them care because you are there as a prize. You're you're kind of just there and you're not part of the team. You're not part of the group and they're all nice guys. Like none of them were were assholes. They were all very welcoming. Mm -hmm. It's just you're not part of the group and that means that you're not really going to make an impact on them. You're not going to impress them in a way that makes them somehow look twice at you really, I don't think, right? So what was the opportunity was what I think especially JRT um didn't see as the opportunity. I think most people don't see as the opportunity because they want to come in and they want to they want to mingle with the talent, right? They don't realize maybe the opportunity is in the after party, off to the side, chatting with guys that see you as something other than a fan, right? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I like to give a shout. I like to, sorry, I like to give a quick shout out to Cody in that like he didn't get to cast. JRT did. He chose the wrong the wrong ECS to attend. <laughs> um, that's that's rough. That's rough. Yeah, it's uh, he's obviously been on before and uh. Huge fan of him. Oh, oh he's gone. he's gone dark. Shut yeah, him down. No. Shut him I, down. I haven't, I haven't moved my mouse in ages. My computer's just like, ah, it's time to go. <laughs> I look like I've got like professional lighting, but really, what I what I have is one of these things. This is like a like a ten thousand lumen LED light bulb plugged into my fan, so I'm like brighter than the sun right now. I can't look into it. I literally can't look into this light. So you got you. You mentioned uh, GRT did uh, quite a bit of prep. He had for quite a few notes. I mean, did you guys do any prep at all, or was it just kind of just go with the flow? We'll see where this goes. I don't want to. I don't want to come off as unprofessional. <laughs> okay? okay. The thing is, I looked at the college game as something that you didn't really need to do much research. For. I looked at the result from the last year. So I, I've made sure, you know, call it the Turkey bowl. You look at the score line from last time. You look at the map. Maybe you look at some of the results of the players. And I looked up like kind of little funny tidbits. Like for example, one of the players had like one game on HLTV, which was the last year's match. And he had like 1.35 rating. And I'm like, don't call him the next Zywoo. <laughs> like he's out here. He's going to be the next Zywoo, right? Like that type of thing where it was like, you know, maybe 20, 30 minutes of just looking into some yeah. small things, trying to get something to talk about, not seriously. Whereas if it was like a serious game, maybe you're looking at like play styles. Maybe you're looking at storylines, things like that. I didn't take it. I didn't take it that way. I figured, you know, we'd cast it. There would be some funny things that happen in game. Maybe you make jokes about there. Maybe there's a couple funny storylines you can bring in. And you try to have a balance where it's maybe like 75% serious. 25% jokey and go from there. Whereas um, I think JRT did a lot of research, took it a lot more seriously, um, which I didn't really, wasn't what I felt like about the game, to be honest. Yeah, I, I was kind of, I, I felt like we, you and me were probably more on the same page in that like, it was more about having fun of like getting the experience, just having a good time and like trying to make the, the game as enjoyable as possible. Like I, I did a little bit of prep as well. Like I, I looked at, I, I looked and watched through the entire, well not the entire, but like skim through the vod of like last show match they did together, just to get a basis of like how the other casters did it as well, which wasn't actually the best example. So I didn't really pay well, too much yeah. attention to that. I, I wasn't. The reason I didn't pay attention to the the other casters was because they were like, well they were college casters, like the way they the way they said and, they were college casters. It was like. Okay. Well, it, well, you could just you could tell oh, that like the nerves, the nerves oh, definitely got to them. Um, oh, did it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it seemed very like because I I'd seen them cast before and it was very very different. Your camera's um, a bit out of focus, by the way. Oh my anyway. god. Hand over it or whatever. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so what has kind of happened since the community cast the challenge for you guys? You, obviously, you spoke a little bit about talking to people at the after party. Is there anything that you can't really talk about that you want to talk about or hint at? Are you, are you, what's, what's next for you guys, basically? I came home 
I had my final on Friday, which I thought was on Wednesday. So I was like at ECS, <laughs> like preparing for my final. And then I get an email on the last day. It's like your final on Friday. And I'm like, oh, it could have been worse though, because I actually looked at the wrong class to find out the date of my final, which means my final could have actually been earlier and I could have been totally screwed. So my final was on Friday. I had a, an event on Saturday and I have MDL on next weekend. So I've been preparing for that while also trying to not neglect my girlfriend or my cat, <laughs> which is a tough one. It's a tough one. So just kind of uh, doing everything. Really. Yeah. Okay. And where can they, where can they find you? Obviously find we'll me put... at Boosties Go yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Patreon, yeah. Pinterest, Tinder, t Grindr. Tinder and Grindr. Oh. Fun pay. Wow. <laughs> of course. I mean, uh, YouTube. Well, I mean, the real ones are YouTube, Twitter, Twitch. Patreon.com slash Boosties Go. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I did demo reviews. And what's your MySpace? MySpace? Yeah. It's Vucius Go. Okay. No, cool, it's cool. Big Daddy Boo. <laughs> Big Daddy Boo. Oh, oh. And uh, so what that should be my that should be my thing. It should be Big Daddy Boo <laughs> instead of Vucius Change Vucius it, Go. change it. Do a no tail and change it. Um and Yumi, what 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 about you? What's uh what's been going on? What's coming up in the uh, future? So actually kind of a whole lot of nothing. because uh, I've had to turn down so many events for this next weekend. I'm just kind of yeah, I'm going to be attending a wedding. Gonna be gonna have a good time. Meet up with the whole family. Just enjoy Christmas and, and kind of ride it out. Um, but that's that's kind of been that's that's the year as a whole wrapped up as for, for as far as I'm concerned. It's a nice little extended break for you then. Yeah, pretty much. Nice. Yeah. And where where can people find you? Just quickly. um, Twitch Yumi with a three instead of an E. <laughs> um, you just have to change it to UM three. I I really do. Um, <laughs> So um 3 tv on Twitter. Uh, don't have a MySpace, a Zanga, or any of that. What's a Zanga? Oh God, see you. You really are. What's You're OnlyFans? You. Someone told me about OnlyFans. <laughs> what is OnlyFans? Someone told me. Let's let's not get too deep um, into that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, damn. Uh, but yeah, those is are. That where you sell bath water and stuff, those, or what? Those are my two main points of traction. And uh, M15 Cassidy on uh, Instagram, if there is. Dude, really you gotta get your shit together, man. Yo, <laughs> listen, what are these names? Your, your branding is much easier. I'm, I'm about to change everything to just like Michael Cassidy something. Like, it just has, has to be easy. Who has UM3, though? Do people really have UM3 everywhere? No, I, I just. I have like all of my personal friends on Instagram, so I just never thought to change. It but to you... like the obscure <laughs> esports name that I have. Yeah, oh, I mean, uh, I'm just saying it should be all the same thing, right? I agree. I agree. But I don't think I'm gonna. I don't know that I'm gonna keep Yumi for the for, forever. So right. maybe you get your friends to start calling you Yumi. <laughs> right. On that, I think we're gonna leave it there. But thank you very much for coming on. Uh, I hope to see some great things from you guys in the future.